Right, um, first of all, thank you very much, everyone. For, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And I think I have a PowerPoint. And secondly, I apologize that my PowerPoint is not very futuristic. But I would like to take this chance to respond to this Congress, especially to the speech of Mr. Girardi, but also the President, to think about the future. Now, let me ask a question. Um, what will 2050 look like? Can you imagine? In 2023, I was asked by the Wired magazine Japan to talk about the year 2050. They were very convinced that what is happening now in 2020s is going to shape what's going to come in the next 30 years. So what is happen happening now is shaping 2050. However, it is a very difficult task to anticipate the future. First of all, we are not sure if we will actually live until then in order to verify our predictions. Because even though 2050, uh, 2050 is not too far from now, but we know that within the t first 24 years of the 21st century, we have already come under the threat of wars, nuclear meltdowns, ecological crisis, and more recently, AI apocalypse. This is what we all know. It's not because we uh, lack in imaginations. Indeed, we can imagine many things to come. For example, the planet Mars could be transformed into a habitable planet for humans. We could download our memories to a machine in order to realize immortality or achieve full automations in all areas, from autopiloting to medical surgery. It is also possible that we could fabricate the first synthetic embryo, legalize marriage between humans and robots, and so on, as you have already heard a lot in the past four days. Yet it is difficult to reflect on such a future without too great a dose of optimism or pessimism. If, we are, if what we are really trying to achieve is a planet that is favorable for the coexistence of different cultures, for the coexistence between humans and non-humans. Today, it is indeed more and more difficult to distinguish reality from science fiction. However, most science fictions they don't really grant us the power to dream. We cannot dream. They either offer us a dystopia, where the human species is going to the end, or they offer us a chicken soup of humanity, in which love, the human love, is the last resort. Pessimistically, we know that all this progress will make us pay a huge price. And we have already seen the ramification of such, demand, such a demand in past decades. In terms of the imminent climate collapse, the so-called sixth extinction, mass unemployment due to automation, and most horrifying, a third world war. We moderns have been facing a dilemma a decision has to be made to affirm or change the direction of our civilization. We have to respond to it. But does it mean to choose between deceleration or acceleration? We must decide whether or not the deceleration of technology, technological progress is a solution to our dilemma because of the problem we are having. Recently, there has been a lot of discussions regarding degrowth, or even what is called a degrowth communism. So I'm not sure if degrowth is a solution. If our understanding of and our relation to technology will remain the same, degrowth will only be a transition towards something even worse. 
and even if we take the growth seriously, then all countries will have to synchronize their degrowth. Otherwise, those who refuse to degrow will remain the strongest in terms of military and economic power. It is hard to imagine how this could happen at all without the climate collapse occurring first. But by then, it will already be too late. The other option would be to accelerate towards full automation, under which wage labor would disappear. And again, we would arrive at some kind of uh, communism. However, we know that automation of one area will lead to the creation of another that produces worse alienations. So let me show you a graph. Uh, the former factories, when the factories become automa automatized, the workers didn't become unemployed nor become liberated, where most of them, as you know, they become workers in the platforms. And uh, this is uh, uh, the data from um, food delivery platform in China, as you can see, that the time allowed to deliver food in 2016 within three kilometers was uh, one hour and then 45 minutes, 38 minutes, and to 2000, it was 30 minutes. And, there, and apparently, there is no uh, longer any room for negotiation and no way to add it back. So the promise of uh, full automation is false. Um, acceleration or deceleration may not really give us a desirable future. Instead, for such a future to be thinkable, it will demand a radical change of our relationship to technology. But what does this radical change consist of? In the past 100 years of modernization, technology has not only become the medium of synchronization of both time and space, but it has already also pervaded our everyday life. And what we can see here is that our, civil, our histories, different histories, are synchronized by technology in the past 100 years and moving towards something apocalyptic. We may recall that on the 1st of September 2017, Vladimir Putin told the ch Russian children that whoever leads in AI will dominate the world. This message becomes very clear when we think of the current war on microchips, which are essential for the development of artificial intelligence. And if we limit our imaginations only to efficiency, to speed, and to the, to the pervasiveness of technology, then we'll only be speeding towards this impasse. The technological competition imposes a uniformity not only on technology itself, but also on our imagination of technology. This uniformity is precisely what prevents us from our imagination from reaching out too far. In December uh, 1914, during the outbreak of the First World War, the philosopher, French philosopher Henri Bergson gave a speech on the war. And he attributes the, uh, the cause of the war to technological development. He believed that each technology, each tool, is a new organ, a new organ. And he, he thinks that in the 19th century, there was an expansion of these artificial organs. And it leads to the situation that the soul is no longer be able to care about these organs. And the uniformity of these organs was the source of the First uh, World War. And we can read here that he claims, I read here, what kinds of a world would it become if this mechanism succeeds the entire human race? And if the people, instead of elevating themselves to a richer and more harmonious diversity, as a person may do what to fall into the uniformity of things. If we agree with Bergson that uniformity of the mechanization and the expansion of the organs was the source of war, then it is clear that the technological progress we are now experiencing will inevitably lead to another large-scale war, 
Therefore, the challenge that we face does not involve how to invent a machine learning algorithm to achieve 100% accuracy in facial recognition or to invent the most powerful weapon, but rather how can we break this impasse. This is what I would like to propose to you, is that instead of moving towards an apocalypse of, technolog of technological development and its imagination, we should open up the question of the future of technologies. And that I would like to propose what I call techno-diversity in order to think how this could be possible to break through the, uh, uh, to break away from the homogenization which is the consequence of colonization, modernization, globalization, as you, you can name it. So what I call techno-diversity means that, uh, that I propose a matrix consisting of techno-diversity, new diversity, and biodiversity. New diversity means that the diversity of thinking, such as the Chilean, uh, have a different way of thinking and being from the Japanese and Indian. This is reflected in language, but also in, every, uh, in the way of being. Technodiversity holds the view that technology, ranging from antique technology to modern technology, all consist of a set of ontological, epistemological, and cosmological assumptions. And in order to prevent homogenization and to develop alternatives, we have to question these ontological, cosmological, and epistemological assumptions to challenge them in order to uh, open up the possibility of diversity. So techno-diversity and new, divers new diversity correlate, and in turn, they interfere with each other. And in order to maintain biodiversity today, we need to uh, consider these three diversity together. Because we don't live, because uh, biodiversity is not an object, objective being external to us. Instead, we live together with all these uh, non-human beings. And the diversity, biodiversity, could only be uh, preserved and maintained through the parallel development of new diversity and uh, uh, techno diversity. Uh, so, for me, the, I think the question is less about uh, regulation, because to regulate, first of all, it means that we already accept the technology and then we try to uh, uh, do something to regulate in order to mitigate its damage. Uh, but rather, I think that we need to develop new normals or new laws for this digital Earth. And we should also recognize that the current technological progress offers us a chance to reconstitute the question of democracy, a reconstitution that allows us to negate the homogeneity and, the di and diversify our digital Earth. Now, the relationship between democracy and technology has not been sufficiently addressed. Technology has only even really thought, been thought as a tool for democracy, either in the Greek kleroterian. Uh, as we know, this is the, the device that the Greek used to uh, achieve democracy. But in our modern time, we have uh, postal systems, we have digital systems, and so on, so forth, so forth. But we know that in the 21st century, the proliferation of digital technology has challenged the, the broadcasting model of mass media of the 20th century. And information is transmitted not only through successions of images and sound, but also via the direct processing of user data. Modern citizens are increasingly become both users and consumers in the sense that they ad have to adapt to new interfaces and algorithms over which they have no control or influence. And this has been our common experience of social media users over the past two and a half decades. We live under the dictatorship 
of these social medias. So how do we believe that on Facebook or on Twitter we can find democracy? This is impossible. Our understanding of democracy is also limited by the means we achieve it. And by doing that, we tend to forget that democracy, if we think about democracy in the 21st century, it can only be achieved through the democratization of technology, which has been undermined by industrial capitalism and consumerism. And this is why I propose to develop the concept of techno-diversity to imagine a possibility to renew our relationship with technologies, but also an inquiry into democracy in the 21st century. I feel that now, more than ever, we must come back to the question of techno-diversity in view of the dilemma of our civilization. This dilemma has been falsely described as choice be choices between acceleration, deceleration, growth, degrowth, optimism, pessimism, regulation, deregulation, machines, and humanity. The quest for and the promotion of techno-diversity should be one of the core of task for us today. And I believe it will demand all of us to think collectively about how this could be achieved. Thank you very much for your attention.